Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Revered as a translator of the Bible into English, William Tyndale was a biblical scholar and linguist who became a leading figure during the Protestant Reformation in the years leading up to his execution for heresy. Over 90% of the King James Bible consists of his translated words that later influenced the trajectory of Christianity across the Atlantic in the New World. The publication of the King James Version of the Bible, the most widely published book in the English language. It's been called our national epic, the noblest monument of English prose, and rivaled only by Shakespeare for the beauty and influence of its language. James Nocht is telling the story of this Bible. It began with a conference at Hampton Court Palace where King James commissioned his new translation as a means of healing the religious divisions that plagued England. James Nocht is in Oxford, where some of the best scholars of the age met to hone the texts which would become part of the national memory. The story of the King James Bible continues now with the translation. From Hampton Court to the Bodleian Library. Yesterday we were on the scene of King James's conference to commission a new translation of the Bible. Today we're at the place where some of the scholars settled down to their task. There were six groups, each responsible for a different part of the Bible, and some of the most important work was done here in Oxford. In the main courtyard of the Bodleian Library, a magnificent place with a statue of James himself, rather magnificent. He is, isn't he? And he would have loved to have seen himself there. He came here in 1605 to visit the scholars at Oxford, and again in 1620 when this yard was finished. And he sits there presiding over a great machine of scholarship. He thought of himself as a grand intellectual king, but also as a great peacemaker. And over him it says, Beati Pacifici, blessed are the peacemakers. Because in Scotland, where he'd been brought up, it had been turmoil for decades, and he tried to reconcile all the warring factions in Scotland. 1603, arrives in England, thinks, right, I am going to sort out a reformation that had never really been finished. And my main way of doing that is with a new Bible. Now let's look at the Latin inscription under the king. Yes, it's a classically pompous thing. Describing James as the most learned, most munificent, best of kings, these structures, that's the new Bodleian he was presiding over, were built for the muses. Glory to God alone, soli Deo Gloria. Well, from the look of it, it doesn't really seem as if it's God alone who's getting the glory there. It's very much the personage of the king that presides over this beautiful quadrangle. James came here to see them all quite soon after commissioning the Bible in 1605 and obviously charmed the pants off them. There's one wonderful remark surviving from his visit here when he said to them, Were I not a king, I would be a university man, and James is flattery, top flatterer, and I could wish, if ever it be my lot, to be carried captive, to be shut up in this prison, and to be bound with these chains, and to spend my life with these fellow captives which stand here chained. The books which at that time were attached to the shelves with chains, and that is sort of shimmering with charm. You know, he's saying, look at me, I'm just a scholar like you. This was a tremendous centre of Renaissance learning, wasn't it? Well, it was. Oxford and Lee Cambridge in the early 16th century was beginning to feel the currents on the continent. People like Erasmus were here. The ideas, of course, were beginning to catch on at the court and in the universities. And in many ways, there's this massive tendency to go back to the wisdom of the ancient world. And the ideal was to be fluent in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And so we can see very clearly there's this desire not simply to read documents in the original languages, but also to be able to pass this wisdom on to those who didn't speak these languages. And to leap back to the original font of wisdom as they saw it, Adam. Yes, the word primitive in the early 17th century is the highest praise you can give. If you say, go right back to the original, that is truth. And on the other hand, innovator or even author is thought to be the wrong way to be going. What effect did the drive to go back to original sources, Alistair, have on biblical scholarship? Well, I think you had to summarize the Renaissance in one sentence. It would be ad fontes, going back to the original sources. For some, that meant classical texts from Greece, from Rome. But of course, for Christian humanists, it meant the New Testament which was seen both as a historical document, but also as a theological document. 
And so there is this very strong sense that the church could be renewed and reinvigorated by being brought back into contact with its title deeds in the New Testament. It's about going back in order to go forward. Before us is an illuminated window, a reminder of one of the most famous alumni of this college and a great man in the history of biblical scholarship, William Tyndall. Alistair McGrath, where does he stand in this story? Because he was an enormously important figure in the 16th century in this world. I think Tyndall is a figure of transition. After Tyndall had done his work, there was no stopping it. The floodgates had been opened. Tyndall was absolutely convinced that both for democratic and religious reasons, everyone should have access to the Bible in their own language. And he was deeply touched by Erasmus's image of the common plowboy, a symbol of purity in those days, reading the New Testament as he plowed. And Tyndall was acutely aware that this was not possible unless someone did the work of translation. Now, there were existing English translations, but they were from medieval Latin into English. Tyndall gave us the first direct translation into English from the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament. And he was quite young when he did this. He was astonishingly young. And I think we need to remember that very often people didn't live very long in those days. He was martyred at the age of 42, 43. And certainly this was the work of a young man, but a young man who knew what he was doing. The evidence suggests that he may have gone to Wittenberg to study under Martin Luther, who was then translating the Bible into German. And I certainly see echoes of Luther's German in Tyndall's English. Of course, we need to remember you weren't allowed to do this this time, so Tyndall's English translation was actually subversive. Tyndall's English began to open people's eyes to dimensions of the biblical text that maybe the Latin translation didn't quite do so. And a good example will be the words of Mary in the opening of Luke's Gospel, which we call the Magnificat, which talks very powerfully and very directly about those who are powerful being overthrown. It's very subversive and very dangerous, and that's not good news if you're the establishment. But I think we can get an idea of the excitement that Tyndall's English created at the time by looking at contemporary records like William Malden, which talks about Tyndall's translation making him want to be able to read English texts to get direct access to the scriptures. Then came I among the said readers to hear them reading of that glad and sweet tidings of the gospel. Then my father, seeing this, that I listened unto them every Sunday, then came he and sought me among them, and brought me away from the hearing of them, and would have me to say the Latin matins with him, which grieved me very much. Then, thought I, I will learn to read English, and then I will have the New Testament and read thereon myself. Those words of William Malden, Adam, remind us how important Tyndall is in the story that takes us right up to the translation that became the King James Bible. We see him gazing here, looking rather older than he was at the time, but nonetheless, that's him. How important was the work that he did, despite it being banned, causing all the difficulties, being seen as subversive? What was its influence over the succeeding decades? Well, I think Tyndall revolutionized English as a language. I mean, it's as big as that. He changed the way in which the English spoke and thought. And his legacy to the translators of the King James Bible is enormous. People have calculated 80, 90% of the words in the King James Bible are Tyndall's. You know, some of the phrases we use every day, bald as a coot. Salt of the earth, we know them all. And it is extraordinary and one of the great mysteries of this story that a man in his late 20s, early 30s, in a garret on the continent, on the run, hunted by the establishment, eventually dying as a martyr for translation, could do this. It's the great mystery of the whole story. So Tyndall, looking down on us now, was the man who laid the foundations for much of what was to come. He did. It's unthinkable. The whole story of the Bible in English is unthinkable without him. He was the material on which all those later translators, a whole series of them through the 16th century, got to work. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.